Well, good morning. Again, now I can see you and actually you can hear me when I say good morning. I'm going to put this chair a little bit away because if I sit down, I may fall asleep. No. <laughs> I am a little tired this morning, but it's okay. And I'm going to ask for forgiveness if I do fall asleep up here. And the second thing I'm going to ask for forgiveness is if I say anything in Spanish. Okay? I was just thinking in Spanish for over an hour or so. If, I, if things come out in Spanish, just, just say, hey, Jose, can you translate? And I'll, I'll say it in English again, okay? But uh, it's so great to be here. Man, I love this stage. I really like this. I was looking down there. Can I sit in the recliner? I, I mean, what can you do here? You know, it's pretty nice. That's cool. Uh, next year, guys, we need to decorate the cafeteria, okay, those that decorate here. You, if you're anywhere around here, you can, you can help us out next year. Well, uh, as we conclude our Christmas series today, the, the carols of Christmas, I hope that you have enjoyed this series. I mean, not only singing the carols, and I love what you're done with the choir and all that, you know, the carolers, uh, but I really hope that you have found value in the lessons that we've learned, the biblical lessons behind the Christmas carols, and uh, I sure have enjoyed them. I've enjoyed studying them, other than this weekend. You know, I didn't know it was so much work to do this in Spanish and English. Goodness. Uh, it took me forever. But, uh, but today we're going to look at a very special carol. They just sang it, Go Tell It on the Mountain. It's a very special carol, and uh, it was written under incredible circumstances and for an incredible purpose. And, and that's why I say it's very special. You see, it is believed that this hymn dates back to 1865. And actually, the author is unknown. We don't know exactly who wrote it. Uh, but it was a song, it was sung by African-American slaves to encourage and to strengthen the people that were living in such difficult conditions at that time. You see, they didn't sing it just to promote the message of the gospel, which you will think, right, when you hear it. They actually sang it to give hope to those in those difficult circumstances. The credit for us singing it today still is given to a gentleman called John Wesley Work Jr. And he actually became the first African-American collector of Negro spiritual songs. And uh, he, he actually wrote a couple of books. His first book was written in 1901 called The New Jubilee Songs. And then in 1915, he wrote The Folk Songs of the American Negro where he included this song. It was actually a very difficult task because back in those days, they didn't write down the songs. They actually passed it from one plantation to the next just orally. They will actually go up to the mountain and sing it so the other people in the plantation will hear him and they will learn the songs that way. So it proved a very difficult task. But, uh, but it's interesting to me that the singers, the first people that sung this song, kind of fulfilled the same purpose that the shepherds did that first Christmas night. You know, the angel came down to the shepherds and gave them the good news, right? And they went out and they proclaimed the good news. And so the people that actually sang this song were, were actually proclaiming the good news that Jesus Christ was born. And so to me, that is interesting. So today, as, as we continue living in... in, in in what I call a hopeless world. You know, these people were living in a hopeless society back then, and today we're still living in a hopeless world. I mean, you just got to look at the news, see what's going on, and, and it feels like we have no hope. We, we, it might not be the same as the time of slavery. You know, we're not walking around in chains in our hands and our feet and in our necks. But, but there's very little hope in this world. And we actually live under a different kind of slavery. We may not see the chains. It may not be physical. But we live under spiritual slavery. Many of us do. Um, we continue to bow down to the desires of our flesh. You know, in Galatians 5, it says, For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. Then in verse 19, it says, Now the works of the flesh are evident. It tells us that we should know if we're living under the flesh. They're evident. We can see them. So this is sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, 
jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like this. Like I said, many of us leave, live under these circumstances. But I'm not going to focus on the negative today. I don't want you getting out of here crying, going, oh, my God, I'm such a sinner. You know, maybe I'll be the first one crying. So I don't want to go there. But this morning I have good news for you. I have good news for you. If you remember, like I said before, last week we spoke in Luke 2, right, about the good news that the angels gave the shepherds. And then the shepherds went out and they saw the baby and they started telling everyone the good news. You see, the good news that they heard from the shepherds transformed their lives. Now, this is the thing. Their, their circumstances didn't change. Their physical condition didn't change. Their, their financial condition didn't change. But their spiritual condition changed. See, they were transformed by the good news that they heard that night. And so today, at the end of today, I'm not going to promise that your circumstances are going to change. You know, you may go back to the same job. You may go back to the same house, the same bills, the same collector on the phone. We'll go back to our same lives. And I can't promise you that physically anything is going to change. My back pain is going to be there tomorrow morning, unfortunately. But I got good news that can transform your life. If you allow the Holy Spirit this morning, he will transform your life. This news has spiritual consequences. So are you ready for it? I am. Are you? I got three people on this section ready. Are you ready for it? All right, let's get you going this morning. I like that. No. Open your Bibles with me in Romans chapter 10. We're going to start reading in verse 5. If you don't have your Bible, you can follow us on the screen. And it says like this. The word of the Lord says, For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down? Or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead? But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I don't know if there's anybody here that hasn't accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. But if you are, you need to hear this very, very well. I want to say it again. Verse 9, read it with me if you want. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Verse 10, for with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen? But how then will they call on his name in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those to preach the good news. Let's pray. Lord God, Father, as we open your word, Lord, I know of my inability, Lord, to explain it. And Father, I ask that your Holy Spirit will work in and through our lives this morning, Lord. Father, I pray that it is the Holy Spirit of God that will speak to us this morning. 
And Father, I beg you, do not allow my humanness to interfere with your message. Speak to each and every one of our hearts, Lord. That's what we're here for. We want to hear your voice. Father, allow us to hear your voice. I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. This passage that we read is, is, is completely packed with a lot of biblical truth. And if we were going to, to dissect the passage this morning, we could spend some weeks here just talking about everything that is in this passage. So I'm not going to uh, unpack everything that is there. But what we want to do, what I want to do is, is, is focus on three truth that we see here. There's three aspects of the good news of Jesus Christ that I see in this passage. And that's what I want to share with you this morning. Okay? The first thing that we have here is that there is salvation in the message of Christ. There is salvation in the message of Christ. You see, when, when Paul starts writing here in verse 5, he talks about Moses and Moses writing about the righteousness that was based on the law. You see, for centuries, the Jewish people had tried and tried and tried to obey the law of God. They tried their best to fulfill every commandment in that law. And you know what happened? They failed. You know, it was impossible it was impossible to obey absolutely everything in the law. See, the idea that Paul is trying to give us here is the following. It doesn't matter what you do or hard, hard, how hard you try on your own. You will never be able to be good enough to earn the salvation. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how hard you try. Trust me, I've tried. You will never be able to earn salvation. Never. See, look at verse 6 and 7 with me. It said, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven or who will descend into the abyss. You know why he's talking there? Even if you were able to ascend into heaven, even if you were able to descend to the abyss, which is impossible, right? But even if you were able to do it, you will still wouldn't be able to earn salvation. You can't do anything to earn it. Nothing at all. Salvation cannot be earned. Salvation cannot be earned. In Isaiah 64, 6, it says, All our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. Or like we're more, more used to hearing it from the New King James Version. It says, All our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. You know what they call a filthy rag? If any of you have babies before the era of the diapers, we had uh, cloth diapers. Remember that? When I got married first and we had our first kid, we didn't have money to be buying diapers, you know. It was expensive. At least for me it was. So we went to the cloth diapers. Hmm. Hmm. What can you say? <laughs> that was a filthy rag. That was a filthy rag. And you see, every good deed I do in the presence of God is like a filthy rag. It stinks in his presence. There's nothing we can do. And of course, you know, we don't see that as a good news. You're, you're probably thinking, okay, Jose, if there's nothing I can do to earn salvation, then what's the point? Why even try? Well, this is the good news. Salvation is obtained by faith alone. Did you hear that good news? Salvation is obtained by faith alone. There's nothing you can do to earn it. There's nothing you need to do to earn it. All you need to do is have faith. By faith alone. You see, you see the payment for sin has already been made. See, the, the penalty for sin has already been given. That's already handled. It's all taken care of. What I need to do is have faith. You see, Jesus Christ didn't just come to the earth to be just another baby born. What we celebrated last week 
It wasn't just another baby. No. Jesus came as the sacrificial lamb of God. Jesus was born to die. That was his purpose. He came to die for you, and he came to die for me. And all we need to do today is accept it by faith. See verse 9 and 10 with me. It says, actually, let's start in verse 8. It says, but what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. Verse 9, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. This is very interesting because Paul is quoting Deuteronomy 30. And, and, and they were using that for the law back in Deuteronomy 30, verse 14. But here he's applying it to our faith. He is saying, salvation is near you. The word is near you. And he says there's two things you got to do. And in verse 10 he explains it as they should happen, right? He says, first of all, with the heart the man believes. And let me, let me point this out. When the Bible talks about your heart and my heart, it's not talking about that pumping mechanism we have in here. Okay? When the Bible talks about the heart, it's talking about the real Jose. It's talking about the innermost parts of Jose. What he's saying is, when you believe in God, this is not just a mental exercise. You have to believe it with all of your being, with your heart. See, if you think that you can accept Christ in order to get away from going to hell, in order to have fire insurance, but you can continue living your life as you want, I'm sorry to tell you, but you are not saved. See, it says it right there. For with the heart, one believes and is justified. The justification, the salvation, the righteousness is only given to the one who believes with the heart. With all of my being. What it's talking about is a me declaring, declaring Jesus the Lord of my life. Is basically what it's saying. It's me surrendering completely. To him. And then he says the second thing is we must confess that belief. It says, for with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Now, you see, confession is not a necessary ingredient for salvation. Okay? But confession is an inevitable result of conversion. See, what happened to, to the shepherds that night, when they heard the news and they believed it, they had to go out and tell somebody. They had to say it. Last weekend when I was preaching in the Spanish service, I used the illustration of when, when I had my first son, Joel, who was up there at the board. You know, that night we were all, you know, in Puerto Rico, I don't know if, if that happens here or if it used to happen. or I don't know, but in Puerto Rico, everybody bets on whether it's going to be a boy or a girl. And I was one of those guys that I didn't want to know what I was going to have. I, I, was just, I just wanted to be a surprise. And everybody will come to me, well, the, the belly looks like this or it looks like that, so therefore it's going to be a girl. Or it's too round, so it's going to be a boy. Or it's too pointy or all this stuff. <laughs> My prayer was I wanted a boy. I don't know why, but I wanted my first child to be a boy. And in February 28, 1985, when that baby boy was born, I went out. I left the hospital. My poor wife, I left her. <laughs> I went through the whole town of Bayamon, and whoever will listen to me, I will tell them, I had a boy. My mother was conducting choir practice at our church, and I went through that church like a storm. I had a boy. 
I had to tell somebody. I had to tell everybody the great news that my first son was a boy. You see, in the same way, those shepherds, when they heard the news that Jesus, the Christ, the Savior, was born, they had to go out and tell somebody. And that is what Paul is saying here. Men, when you have real conversion, when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and the Savior with all of your heart, you have to go out and tell somebody. You have to confess it with your mouth. You have to confess it. Have you surrendered your life to Christ today? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Are you just living the life? Or have you accepted him with all of your heart? It's a good question. Don't end 2014 without answering it. Don't do it. The second good news I have for you is that there is equality in the message of Christ. There is equality in the message. There's salvation in the message of Christ. There is equality. Aren't aren't you tired of the injustices of this world? I mean, I sure am. Seems like every time I change the channel, there's something else going on. Seems like everything I looked at, there's some injustice going on. Man, I don't get paid enough. I mean, I work too many hours and they don't recognize me. If you have kids, their favorite three words are, it's not fair. It's not fair. (laughs) And you know what? It's not. We live on a fallen world. It's not fair. This world will never be fair. We are in a fallen condition. And in that condition, we can't be fair. Everybody's looking for their own good. And if you do nice things for people, then they treat you like a doormat. Right? And it's not fair. (laughs) Fairness and justice is not something we can produce in this fallen world. The world can't give what it doesn't have. It can't give it. Now, with God, it's completely different. See, with God, God is completely just, and that God is completely fair. See, he doesn't look at where, where you're from. He doesn't look at me and say, well, Jose, you're really not good because you're half Puerto Rican, half Dominican. I mean, <laughs> you see, I already got it. Half Cuban, married a Dominican. Did my mother hear that? I hope not. <laughs> he didn't say, you're a mix. You're so mixed up. You're no good. He doesn't say that. God doesn't look at my neighborhood and say, well, he doesn't live in a good neighborhood. He doesn't look at the financial condition. None of that. God is completely just and completely fair. You know what God looks at? At the heart. You remember when Samuel went to find David, God had sent him to Jesse's house. Was it Jesse? I say Isai this morning and now I couldn't remember the name. He went to Jesse's house, right, to find the next king of Israel. And and Samuel's looking at all these big dudes. They're coming in. They're looking good. They're strong. I mean, something like this, you know. (laughs) And Samuel is going, that must be the next king. That guy looks good. He's strong. He's smart. And what did God say? No, man. Stop looking at his appearance. Because I look at the heart. God looks at the heart. And it's because of that that salvation is available for everyone. See, God is not looking at people and going, well, you know what, I'm going to give salvation to Brian because he's such a good guy. But you know, Mike, oh my goodness. Mike, I'm sorry. I can't cover you. He's not doing that. God is completely fair. And because of that, salvation is available to everyone. Check this verse out. Look at verse 4. We didn't read verse 4, but look at verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Everyone who believes. Look at verse 11. 
everyone who believes will not be put to shame. It's for everyone. Verse 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Who's going to be saved? Everyone that calls on the name of the Lord. Salvation is available to everyone. Salvation is available to you today. If you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, salvation is available. But not only that, salvation is accessible to everyone too. It's accessible. It's not only available. I mean, we have a car dealership across the street. There is 250 cars available across the street. But not many of us can go and actually buy one. Though they are available, they're not accessible to me, right? Unless I can afford it. But salvation is not only available to you, it's accessible to you. Look at verse 12. He says, there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all. And he bestowing his riches on all who call on his name. See, in the eyes of God, we're all the same. We are all the same. Even if I think of myself better or worse than you, even if I look at my circumstances and they're better or worse than yours, in his eyes we're all the same. And so salvation is available and accessible to you as well as it is to me. Man, that is great news. That is great news. You know, God loves you so much. He doesn't love me more than you, and he doesn't love you more than me. He loves us so much that it's even hard to understand. You know, I still don't understand why. Understand that? I, I mean, I know what it is to love somebody. I have three kids, two grandkids. You know, I love them to death. I have my wife of 30 years. I love her. But I still don't understand why God does certain things he does for me. It's like, wow. Why do you love me like that? Where does that come from? It says in John 3.16, we all know the verse. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his only son. That whoever, it's for everyone right there again. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting or eternal life. See, the little kid's songs say it this way, we are all precious in his sight, right? And it's true. You are precious in the sight of God. Every time my wife sees our, our grandson, hi, precious, how are you? Hi, precious, that's her word. You are precious in the sight of God this morning. And that is good news. He sent his only son. The only purpose that Jesus was born was to die for you. That's it. He had you in his mind when he went to the cross. He had you. And he had me. It was the only purpose. He was born to die. So salvation, there is salvation in the message of Christ. And there is equity. Equitable. Equitability, equity, equitability, equidad, <laughs> equality in the message of Christ. But you know the message of Christ doesn't only come with benefits. It comes with benefits, but it also comes with responsibilities. See, now that we know the good news, now for those of us that have accepted the good news, now that we have done that, there are some things we need to do. See, we're not supposed to keep it as a secret. You know, you're not supposed to get converted and then, okay, let me not tell everybody because it's a good secret to keep. You know, or, or you're not supposed to go tell only the people you like. You know, I'm going to tell Mike, but I don't want Zeta to hear it. I just want Mike to hear it. We're not supposed to do that. See, our responsibility is to tell others. Our responsibility is to let others know about the conversion 
that happened, the transformation that took place in our lives. It is a responsibility. And like we said before, if it's a true conversion, you shouldn't be able to be quiet about it. You will want to tell people. Because out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Right? So if I surrender my heart to God and I believe in Jesus Christ with all of my heart, my mouth should speak. In verses 14 and 15, it says, How then will they call on him in whom they have never believed? They have not believed. And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? How are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? See, he says it like in, in reverse order, right? Somebody has to preach it so that somebody hears it. And that person accepts it. That is our call. That is our call. And Paul says it this way. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. You see, there is beauty in the message of Christ. There is beauty in the message of Christ. When Christ was about to leave this world. Man, I can only imagine about all the things he could have told the apostles, right, the disciples. I mean, there, there must have been a bunch of stuff that he could have shared with them. And I'm sure in the apostles' minds, there must have been a thousand questions just going through that mind, through those minds. But Jesus didn't talk about all sorts of things. He talked about one thing. He said in Matthew 28, it says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. It says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. See, we have a privilege to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is our privilege. I don't know if you ever think about these things, but can you, how many angels does God have in heaven? A lot, right? Can you imagine when God looked at that one angel and said, hey, you, you go and tell the shepherds that Jesus Christ is born. That is a privilege. Don't you think? I'm the one. I've been selected. I'm giving the good news. That is a privilege. Now imagine the shepherds. They hear the good news and they have the privilege of going and sharing it with everybody. They are the ones. The lowly ones of Bethlehem are chosen to go give the great news of the gospel to everyone. That is a privilege. And you know now that is our privilege. We have a privilege to go and tell the good news. But it's not only a privilege. It is our duty. It is a privilege, but it is our duty. You see, Jesus didn't go to the guys and say, you know what, Pete? You know, when you have time, if you have time, I want you to go and make some disciples. Actually, if your boss lets you go, go ahead. If your wife is not upset, just go and make some disciples. But only if you can, bro. That's not what he said. He said, go and make disciples. He didn't give him a suggestion. He gave him a command. He said, you are to go and make disciples. And that is our command today, too. Go and make disciples. And man, I sure hope that as part of your resolutions for 2015, that one of them is to go and make disciples. See, there is salvation in the message of Jesus Christ. There is equality. That's what people are looking for. They're looking for justice. They're looking for fairness. And they're looking for salvation. They may not know it. 
what they're looking for. And you know the message. You have the good news for them. It's time to go and make disciples. The song said it this way, go tell it on the mountains, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountains that Jesus, the Christ, is born. Man, I sure pray that you do that today.